Bill Blythe moved to Chew Magna in the early 1970s and has been writing a gardening column for the Chew Valley Gazette, originally the Chew Valley Digest, ever since. Not surprisingly, Bill loves his garden. So, introduce me to your garden, Bill. Well, this is why I bought the house. It's this best spare plot. But you see, this is my area because it might look rubbish now, but there's everything growing still. You have to protect your winter brassicas against the pigeons, but then the leeks will be okay, the Swiss chard, the beet, there's some chicories, the celery and the celeriac I'm still watering. All the rest is going on the compost heap. And that's, that's only what, half what's happening at the moment. And of course, we haven't even mentioned that lovely those raspberries. So let, let's go down and look at your raspberries. Yes, but on the other thing you mentioned, there's compost. That's important stuff, isn't it? The, that's the power station of the whole garden is, is a two compost heaps. Two is a minimum. Look at these, these raspberries, Bill. These raspberries. Now look, we're in October. We're, I yes. didn't know you'd get raspberries in October. Well, this is autumn raspberries. You know, these are the ones you cut down completely in November and then they grow raspberries, the fruit, on this next year's crop. And the uh, birds leave them alone? Yes, and, and also they don't get any insects and therefore they don't get any virus infection. Now there's a clue to Bill's scientific past, something you'll hear about later. This bit of knowledge helps a lot. It, it helps if, if you're old <laughs> and you've had a long time to learn. <laughs> you have to pick up something, don't you? So uh, yes, you do accumulate, a, I hope, a certain amount of knowledge. <laughs> Bill is quite happy to share his beautiful garden. Yeah, well, the other half of the garden uh, is not mine. It, it, it belongs to the boss, <laughs> who has strong views on her gardening. And uh, tell, tell me how you split it up. What do you look after and what does she look after? I look after the vegetables. Pammy looks after the flowers. Although I don't think she looks after them properly, uh, but she looks after them because if we're to live happily together, we have to share it out separately. And, and that's the way it is. <laughs> Bill grew up in rural Lancashire, where his first gardening memories were with his father. Father was always a gardener because we lived on vegetables <laughs> and he grew them and that was important to me and I loved helping him and bashing the heavy clay soil of Lancashire was one of my earliest memories but then also it was soft water so the soap was nice soapy water and then the dolly tub we could throw over the broad beads to stop the black fly so even at that stage I was learning about things that developed in the garden so that was my early gardening <laughs> and then you went to school and what happened there <laughs> I, I was told that i should go in for a, a scholarship so i went in with a scholarship so i went to a, a grammar school in Ley leyland and there they had societies on friday afternoon and i was a, the only member perhaps of the gardening society which was wonderful for me because i could get away and i could have a garden and the art teacher even bought a marrow off me, which was very kind of her. I don't know what she did with it. But really, for me, <laughs> the joy was not only making a garden out of a field, but watching the white throat's nest and, and the partridge nest that I also saw. So I could, without knowing it, study nature all the time. And that was my love. It really was. So then eventually, you know, it was school certificate time. And I did fairly well in Latin and English. So the headmaster had the power and he said, Blythe, you'll go into Latin and English. No, no, no. I took one decision in my life. I took my parents to see the headmaster and said, excuse me, but if you make me go into that, I shall leave. I want to do science. So he said, all right, science is maths, chemistry and physics. That's it. That's the only choice. You do that. A year later, they introduced biology. And I went to the headmaster again and said, please, could I go on to biology? No, he said, you'll need your maths for your chemistry. And that was it. So, against his own better judgment, Bill ended up studying chemistry at university. But I really wanted to be a biologist. But fortunately, my tutor was a medic and he worked in the bacteriology department. And he introduced me when I finished the degree uh, into the bacteriology department and the man said yes yes come and join us so I was all set 
to do uh, work on um, whooping cough vaccine. But then my whole career, I think, has been a, a, a series of lurches from one direction to another by chance. In the mid-1950s, a vaccine for polio was invented in America. But there was a problem. There was a terrible error. A large number of children were made ill. Some of them died. Therefore, somebody sensible in our government said every batch of vaccine that comes out of the manufacturers has to be independently tested by a new group, entirely independently. But we haven't got anybody to run it. So they chose the two chaps who I was working with, with the uh, whooping cough vaccine in Manchester. And Blythe got taken on at the Lister Institute. The Lister Institute is, was very famous at that stage. It was known as the Women's Institute because there were very, very few scientists who were women. But there were three famous ones in the Lister. One of them was Dame Harriet Chicks, who had sorted out the B vitamins in India. Muriel Robertson, who was rumoured <laughs> rumoured at least, to have cycled around East Africa in her time. She worked on anaerobic bacteria and they smelt. But the third one was Emmy Kleinerberger Nobel. Emmy couldn't run a research programme full of the money, although she was a very good scientist. So I was given freedom to reign, to, to enjoy myself. Someone was paying me to do what I really wanted to do. And it was marvellous. Also, the Lister Institute was on Chelsea Bridge Road. Right across the road was the Chelsea Gardens. And where's the Chelsea Gardens? But the Chelsea Flower Show. And the, the Royal Horticultural Society Fellows were encouraged to give their free tickets to anybody who wanted to go to the Chelsea Flower Show. So every year, for a couple of days, I went to the Chelsea Flower Show. What could be better for people like me? Back on the garden tour, Bill is keen to show me some more of his produce. Now this is interesting. Well, it's interesting because these onions are going to be... St shall I just pick one of them? Uh, they can stay there uh, and some of them will still be in use. The end ones will still be in use in May, you wow. see. But as long as they're dry, the fact that it freezes, it just doesn't matter at all. These are just ordinary onions. When did you pick those? Ooh, late August, early September. Wow. Um, and they'll stay like that till May? Oh, yeah. Well, they, I mean, if I haven't used them, I mean, there'll be very few left in May. And you yeah. told me that the, the secret is not to get them wet. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. They, they must be well dried. You see, they're, they're really... They're, they have to be dry. And, and I'll clean them off a little bit. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and they'll yes they're, and they're, let air at them is that right? Oh yes, you see they're not they're not on the ground. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're on a on a. On well, a, you see, it's all these little tips yeah, make yes. a difference, don't they? Yes, quite. <laughs> yes, yeah. but um, I always use a, a fungus, a mycorrhizal fungus, with the onion sets on the roots, and it just improves that they, they grow terrific root systems. Uh, everybody knows about root grow and mycorrhizal fungi now, but. <laughs> 20 years, no, 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 30 years ago, people used to think fungi were dangerous and you had to use fungicides and get, kill everything. Far from it. We rely on fungi. And you can, it's all part of the organic gardening to oh, add fungi. It's part of, yes, it's, it's part of the whole system. We live in nature, we're part of it. That's the important <laughs> thing. Yes. Yes. After three years at the Lister Institute, Bill was given another opportunity, studying trachoma, a debilitating eye infection in Africa. He then continued this work trying to develop a vaccine back in England. For the next oh, 13 years we were studying trachoma and the organisms that were causing it and trying to develop and did develop a, a vaccine against it. Unfortunately not all vaccines work. We were very fortunate last year the vaccines are brilliant and everybody should have them. Right, end of, end, of, <laughs> end of that bit. But eventually the government decided, a cost-cutting exit, I'm sure, that they couldn't afford to keep studying these tropical diseases, so they would close the trachoma unit. But they were very kind. They gave us notice, and they didn't sack us. They said to Bill, Blythe, you know, go and find out where do you want to work. So for a year, I spent a year travelling around different universities and that's how I came to Bristol. And that was 48 years ago. 
and that's when we bought this house and we've lived here ever since. And you were saying part of the reason you ended up in Tumegna is that you wanted some land because you, you'd already, with your scientific mind, you already had begun to understand the science about soil? Uh, for a long, long time I'd been very influenced by the fact that the world runs itself biologically. It controls everything superbly biologically, not chemically. We were in the stage of everything being chemical and new chemicals were the, the answer. Not to my way of thinking. The organic message was the message of biology and I was particularly interested in having more land to be able to do more things. So we came to this village and we've been happy there ever since. But meantime, this has been the other story of my life really, quite apart from anything scientific. The idea of self-sufficiency, of growing sufficient fruit and vegetables for the whole year. And at that time then, I was very interested in trying to gently put the idea that organic horticulture, organic agriculture, biology was the way. And I started to write small articles for what was then, I think, called the Chew Valley Digest. And the various editors have since carried on. It's a monthly paper and I've been going on it for, well, 30 odd years probably. And the editors have always let me write what I wanted to, but I, what I wanted to was to try to show the interrelationships between the insects, the insects that prey on other insects, the insects that eat your, your plants, the reaction of the plants to the fact that the insects might be eating them. The plants are very active in this kind of thing. Nature is wonderfully, superbly controlled. It's been doing it for billions of years, and we are part of it. That's what I'm trying to do. And wouldn't you say, I mean, to me, I, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. And from those little insects, if we don't have a good relationship with them, everything up to the global level is not working right. Starting with DDT, we have been killing insects. And I mean, there are worse things than DDT, much more toxic and cause a lot of trouble. We've been killing insects very, very efficiently for 70 or 80 years now. I mean, We've not got over the fact that insects are vital and everything, <laughs> virtually everything relies on insects. We shouldn't be using any insecticide. Similarly, only really, fairly recently have we realised that fungi are very interesting and very important and we rely on all these unseen things and we're part of it. Tell me what you love about gardening. I love being in it and growing things. My father once said to me, he said, gardening's about growing things, not killing things. And that's the essence of it. There's been far too much killing things. Just, just having a seed and growing in the plant and then seeing that you can eat something. That's wonderful. I, I, it's part of being sane, it's part of being happy, I think, really. Can I ask you, over all these years of experience and your scientific training, your being in the garden every day, close to what you're doing, what lessons, what simple lessons would you say you've learnt that we should all take on board? Oh, there are too many. Uh, no, it is that we are part of nature, we are in great, we are the dominant species in the whole world and the seven billion of us can do so much damage that we might well ruin it and, and unless we alter our attitudes and it's the basic attitude that we shouldn't damage nature, that's, that's maybe the basis of it. Mm. And just looking at the year we've just had, Everyone says there are worrying signs that climate change is affecting things. Is that something you'd agree with? Oh, I, I wouldn't agree with it. I, I wholeheartedly, yes, of course I agree with it. But the, the variation in our, the difference between weather and climate is not apparent to some people. The climate is getting warmer. The weather is very variable. We can all remember these huge variations in the weather but that's not the climate. We'll have cold winters again, we'll have hot summers again, but we'll get 
the extremes much more frequently, and that has been shown these last couple of years, all over the world, the weather is becoming more extreme. The climate is also getting warm, and that's the reason for the weather becoming more extreme. That's the important point. Yes. Do you think politicians are doing enough? <sighs> it's, it's, it's easy to criticise politicians, but lots of intelligent people go into politics to try to improve things. But I think one should reasonably say that their background is often not science. Now, you'd expect me to say that, of course, but I fear that I would much prefer better science to be in the background of politics, not grafted on. I think they've had to learn it intellectually rather than knowing it in their heart. And that's, that's the difficulty with politicians. They come from a different group. And yet the mantra through COVID is trust the science. Thank God for trusting you. Yes, but, but of course we have the anti-vaxxers at the time now who there's an awful, a fantastic lot of misinformation. I mean, it, you'd expect me to say this because I've been in vaccines all my life, but vaccines are the answer to protection against infection. Uh, I was uh, horrified by uh, some quote from America yesterday. The man said, God has given me an immune system that will protect me, therefore I do not need vaccines. God also gave him infections that could kill him. Therefore, they also had the intelligence to develop vaccines against those infections. Oh, there's an awful lot of misinformation. Stay with the science. The scientists would run the world terribly, I'm sure, but I'm a scientist. I can't do anything about it. But you're also a gardener. Yes. And, and you're also a lovely writer in the Chew Valley Gazette. And can I just say thank you for all your years of sharing your knowledge? Wait, no, it's me that thank you because I've had the fun of getting through my, the ideas that interest me and, and being allowed to do it. And if anybody wants to read it, that's very nice. Thank you very much.